Hello, welcome to Copyrights. I am Courtney Lytle. I am an attorney here in Atlanta. I am also an adjunct professor at Emory, and I teach coincidentally copyright law. So I am giving you kind of the abbreviated and no exam version of copyrights. If you would like an exam, no, stay after no. and I'll be happy to do it. Um, but assuming that none of you would want to do that, um, we'll just skip that part of the class. I'm also going to skip some of the painful details that you will never actually need to know. The goal today is to give you kind of an overview of what copyright is and to an extent isn't and how it can protect the things that you're creating. And I kind of try to focus this on the idea of you guys are creating stuff and you would like to have it protected with copyright law. I will tell you how to do that. Now, I have to confess a lot of my examples when I'm teaching tend to be books and things like that. Um, partially it's because books are a lot easier to make examples out of than software code. Um, but I know that in this panel a lot of you guys are indeed programmers and that code and programs are the things that you're going to be more interested in. Those are also covered by copyright. It's a strange fit, but we'll get to that. But when I'm talking about how the law works and how it applies, if copyright law applies to the thing you're creating, then it's all the same rules. It doesn't matter what it is you've created, whether it's choreography, whether it's a novel, whether it's software. All of that's going to fit within the same rules, whether that makes sense or not. And often that would be not. Nevertheless, same rules for everyone. So, starting with the stuff that we're not talking about, because that clears out a little bit of questions that I will get later. Um, there are basically four types of intellectual property. One of them is trade secrets, which is sort of helpful, but not what we're talking about. Trade secrets are things that are valuable to your business because no one else knows them. It's the Coke formula. It's the 11 herbs and spices of Kentucky Fried Chicken. It can be some cool method you have. It can be your customer list. It can be things like that but it's valuable because it's a secret. The short answer for that is don't tell anyone. Um, the way to keep a secret is between two people is to shoot one of them, but we don't try to do that in here. The answer is instead don't tell anyone. Actually, if you use non-disclosure agreements and basic security on your stuff to take reasonable steps to make it secret, the law will help you keep it secret, okay? So if you're reasonable about keeping it secret and say, this is a trade secret, and then don't show people, the law helps. That's not what we're talking about. It's hard to get rich keeping things secrets. Second one we're not talking about are patents. Patents are science. They're the inventions. They're um, the pharmaceuticals, the machines, the inventions that will save the world. We're not talking about that. That's useful, arguably more so than copyright. But the folks who do pat patent law are way smarter than I am. Um, to, in order to be a patent lawyer, you have to actually take basically a pre-med selection of courses while you're undergrad, or you have to go back and do it either while you're in law school or after you get out of law school. Generally, lawyers can't do science and math. Our standing joke, which other people laugh at and we cry on the inside a little bit, is that if we could do science and math, we'd be doctors. And it's true. Um, <laughs> but instead, we're lawyers. Um, give me a second. Okay. Um, but at any rate, so for those of us who um, took the same science classes as most of the football team in college, um, I'm not a patent lawyer. Patent lawyers understand the chemistry or the biology or the real science behind it because you have to understand the science to be able to write a valuable patent. Now, if you guys actually are also inventors, the one thing I will tell well, the one thing is actually several things. Just pretend it's one thing with subsets. Otherwise, we have to do the Monty Python thing and get to among the things that I will tell you. But for patents, yes, you need a lawyer. Absolutely, got to have one. If it's valuable enough to go through the patent process, don't screw it up by hiring someone who's not actually a patent lawyer. Patent agents um, will tell you that they are every bit as good as patent lawyers, but if your patent is valuable enough to go through the expensive process, hire a real honest got patent lawyer. The value for how the patent is written and the protection that you get downstream is worth it. It is expensive and it is slow. 20K is cheap legal fees for a patent. Years is how the time it takes to get one issued is usually measured. So it's nothing quick, it's nothing easy, but if it's an incredibly cool invention, it's worth patenting. We're not talking about that either, except what we just did, but not anymore. The third one is trademarks. 
trademarks y'all understand. Um, look, here's one. In the pre-COVID years, I would go steal someone's can of soda in the, um, from the audience, but now I'm sure that would freak people out. So look, y'all know who made this bottle of water because it's an identifiable label. We know that this was actually the most brilliant thing the Coca-Cola company ever figured out. If you take the water from their manufacturing process after they purify it and everything before they start adding the carcinogenic caramel color and the flavors and the bubbles, so before they do the expensive stuff to it and add their trade secrets, this is what they have and they charge as much or more for this as they do for the finished product of the manufacturing pro process. Pretty clever. Um, unfortunately, whoever figured this out was not the same person who thought of New Coke, otherwise it may have balanced out. But <laughs> trademarks tell you the source of the good or service. We know that comes from the Coca-Cola company because we know Dasani is Coke because we live in Atlanta, we know everything about Coke. Um, but you know, which company has made your cola, you know what to expect inside the product. That's what trademarks are about. Trademarks are really not about protecting the company's intellectual property, the way we're going to talk about for copyright. They're really about protecting the consumer. Make sure you get what you think you're getting. You can't have, no one's going to be allowed to have a can that looks just like Coca-Cola, but slightly has a different vowel in it. No, the Coke lawyers will seek you down and kill you if you try to do that. Um, Seriously, Coke trademark lawyers, don't mess with them. They take their brand very seriously. So it is, of course, of great value to them, but the way the law is set up is really to protect you guys. It's a Consumer Protection Act. Also not what we're talking about, but when you're talking about slogans or logos or brand names, those are trademarks, not copyrights. Anything that is just a word or two is not going to be copyrightable. Anything that's you know, meant as a logo, well, you can copyright the picture, but you're not going to be able to keep people from using it the way you would in trademark. Copyright is all of the artsy stuff, all of the creative stuff. It's your books, it's your paintings, it's your drawings, it's your music, it's your movies, it's dances, and code. <laughs> um, but the thing with, with copyright is it's not protecting the substance of what you're saying. It's how you're saying it. If I write a nonfiction book, for instance, you're welcome under copyright law to take every single fact and clever thing that I learned that I put into this book. You can have those and use them in your own book. What you can't steal is how I said it. Copyright's really meant for nonfic or for fiction, but it applies to nonfiction equally well, except that the facts, usually in nonfiction, what's really valuable is not my brilliant storytelling method, but actually the things I'm saying. Those things I'm saying are not protected. Now, they're recording me, so that means that my delivery today is being fixed in a tangible medium. That's all it takes to have a copyright. If I were just speaking and no one was recording it, there would be no protection for my speech at all, because it's not fixed, it's transitory. Federal copyright protection attaches the moment you have your work, we'll call it, that's the lawyer word, but your creative brilliance fixed in a tangible medium. Video counts as a tangible medium. Any of you who are, are actually as old as I am, when you say video, you think of video cartridges and video tape. Um, for the rest of you who were not quite as old as I am and don't remember the dinosaurs fondly, you're thinking digital anyway, but that's fine, digital counts. That's fixed. Even though when the law was written in the 70s, clearly they were not thinking about this kind of thing. So now that I'm being recorded, there is a copyright in my, in my presentation here. So none of you guys can use this presentation elsewhere. You can't take all of the words I'm using. God help you if you tried. Um, but if you took every single fact that I put out here today and put them into your own presentation, you would not be violating my copyright in my speech today. I don't own any of the facts, any of the actual relevant parts. Okay, maybe some of the pattern that's not valuable um, and that you kind of wish I would stop anyway, that you would naturally cut out if you were going to pirate this little speech, yeah. Um, so the only thing that's arguably protectable is the stuff no one wants. The facts are not. Just any ideas are not copyrighted. Anything that pushes over into the patent side of the world, any process, any um, invention, any facts, anything that's actual, is not going to be covered by copyright. What's covered by copyright is your expression of it. How you say it is what's protected. So you can see why that's not going to be terribly valuable in the patent world, 
when what you care about is what you just invented, the process you've made, the super drug that you've just made. Well, I'm not going to touch the actual substance of it. Copyright has very limited protection as well. As I said, the substance of what I'm saying is not protected, how I say it is, but if someone else, we'll say in an alternate universe, because that would make more sense, were delivering this same speech to another room just like you and happened to independently create this exact presentation, they're not infringing. Copy is right in the word of this law, copyright. It's the right to copy. Um, so, as long as you didn't copy me, if you came to the exact same result, you didn't actually violate my copyright. Very, very different from patents, where if you are the first to invent and the first to file, then you can preclude anyone from using your process and using your invention, even if they invented it themselves and can prove. Doesn't matter. You can preclude them from using it, because patents have a much broader scope of protection. But remember how much it costs to get there? You better get something for it. The good news is for copyrights. Now, you kind of caught me at the beginning saying that now that it's being recorded, I have a copyright in it. This is not because I filed a bunch of paperwork before I came in here. I didn't, I promise. But as soon as it's fixed, it is covered by federal copyright law. You do not have to file a thing. However, if what we're talking about is something that you think is going to be valuable to you, if it's something you're going to try to sell or license, copyright it. Make the filing. Here's the good news. You can do it. You certainly do not need one of my people to do a copyright filing. 35 bucks, simple form, done and done. Be careful where you go to do it. Copyright.gov. Easy enough to remember. There, it, but if you type it slightly wrong, of course, there's a billion pe people trying to hijack you to their site where they will s make it look like they are the government and there will be extra fees to help you file it. Most of them actually will file it eventually, but you're just burning money and, and increasing the likelihood of an error. The copyright forms are simple. If you don't quite understand something that they're asking, there's a helpline, call it. They will give you very good information about how to fill out the form and what they mean by each of the terms you'll probably breeze through, honestly, without any problems. When I have like actual artists, um, I worry about them a little bit. Um, but you guys will blow through it, no problem. If you do have a question, like I said, the um, refer reference attorneys are super helpful. Don't ask them for legal advice. They'll help you figure out the form. They'll help you figure out, well, this is what I've written, the, you know, this is what I have, this is what I'm trying to register, does that make it this, this, or this. I have to pick one of these. Which one is this? They'll tell you that. Which would be the best way for me to file this? No. How should I do this? No. Which is this? You know, they'll answer the factual questions, not the strategic ones. If you want strategic answers, you have to actually pay one of me. So, free answers from them, though. So, you can file your own. It's cheap. It's easy. And this is where I have to ask my question. How many of you know about the poor man's copyright? Yeah, okay. For those of you who don't know, just shut your ears so that your brain is not polluted with this nonsense. Um, I'm, before I explain why, I'm going to tell you what seems like a completely unrelated story. Um, in my college era part of my life, when seriously, they're pterodactyls, we had to watch out that they weren't killing, picking children out of the pool. Um, I took a lot of first aid classes. One of the things they told us when trying to really gross us out by showing us photographs of third degree burns is never put butter on a third degree burn. I thought that was a strange thing to say. They didn't mention any other condiments, just butter. Well, apparently, it's an old folk thing that you would put butter on a burn. Okay, first off, don't do that. That's just stupid. Um, the poor man's copyright is just as bad. Those of you who did not know about it, I kind of feel bad because it's kind of like telling you don't put butter on a burn. You were better off not knowing any of this. But those of you who were already tainted, let me explain this. The poor man's copyright is put your, usually manuscript, in an envelope and mail it to yourself and leave it sealed. Oh look, it's evidence that I wrote it first. Okay. No judge in the history of the world. I mean, I'm going back to when there were togas on people, not just for parties, but actually in court. Um, through today and in going forward for the next nine million years 
no judge has ever or will ever open an envelope that you mailed to yourself and look at what's in it to see if it matches what's in dispute in the courtroom. I promise. Never, ever, ever. I'm not a litigator. I'm a corporate lawyer. But I took evidence in school because I had to. There is an entire class that every lawyer has to take about what is admissible as evidence and what is not. Every single thing that we learn in that class, then a whole lot of things that only the litigators know, all say that will never, ever work under any circumstances. And by the way, the poor man's copyright, given today's mailing rates, probably costs more than your copyright filing fee at 35 bucks. So don't mail it to yourself. That's just stupid. It does you no good whatsoever. Trust me, it will never, ever, ever be admissible in court. File it with the Copyright Office. If you care about this particular work, file it. You are protected by copyright once you fix it in a tangible medium, but no one knows about it, so it's not very enforceable. There are a whole lot of details of exactly what you get when you file, but one of them is obvious proof that you had already written it at that point. The other is you're allowed to sue under um, federal law to protect your copyright. So the things that you really want from a copyright, you really only get when you file. So you have no excuse, file it. If you're a photographer and you take like 9 million pictures every day, because you started doing this after film, um, was that gone? You don't have to file each individual picture. Put a bunch of them together, call it a collective work, and file that as one document. You don't have to file each individual photograph. You can make it like an anthology of pictures and just call it one work, and then each one is protected within it. Okay. So we've talked about the filing, we've talked about what is covered in copyright. When we get into things within the work, when we're talking about books, which is kind of the easiest example, as I said, are the characters in my book protected? Is the world I've created in my series protected? Is my plot protected? Well, they're not facts, because it's fiction. Um, same thing if I'm drawing. Is the subject of my drawing protected? Is the idea of how to draw it protected? The answer to all the things that I said about the drawing or no. Um, the idea of drawing a beautiful landscape, I can't own that. Everyone can do one. If I did a really beautiful landscape, which given my artistic talents is really, really unlikely, um, if I drew that beautiful landscape, it's not like I can keep someone else from doing the same thing. The only thing people can't do is copy mine. Same thing with a book. If I write a plot that's brilliant, well, depending on how detailed you are when you describe my plot is going to be where the protection starts and stops. If Shakespeare were current, rather than long enough ago that his um, copyrights would have long since expired, um, if we're talking about Romeo and Juliet, y'all have heard of that, I trust. If we, st if we describe it as pretty much boy meets girl, then it gets sad. I can't own that plot. And there's a big, huge difference between boy meets girl, then everyone dies, and, you know, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou? There's a huge spectrum in between there. Somewhere closer to where the actual words are involved and the actual characters are fleshed out, you start to realize, oh, either those guys need to buy some pants or I'm doing Shakespearean. Okay, somewhere in there where you start to recognize it, that's where the protection's going to hit. So if I have this great idea and I'm going to write my book about this orphan who doesn't know where he's from and doesn't know who his parents are and is living miserably, never has enough to eat, is cold, doesn't have anywhere comfortable to live, the people around him are really nasty to him, and he is just you know, living in misery, and then over the course of a little bit of time with some weird people coming in and out of his world, he starts to realize that he actually can do things that other people can't. Maybe he can do magic, but no one believes in that. Okay, how many stories have I just described? All of them? Um, somewhere I have to start making more detail than just that plot. Because you know what happens next is he discovers he can use magic. So he starts to study it. He finds someone who will teach it to him. And then before he's finished with his studies, he has to break away to go defeat the great evil. Star Wars? Harry Potter? Who can tell? At that point, it's still not protectable. Once I tell you who this kid is, and I tell you more about him. Is he the assistant pig keeper or is he on some weird desert planet with two moons? That starts to give you those details. As I flesh out the details, as you start to feel like you know who these people are in my book, as you start to know where, we're, where we are in my book, 
And it's not because I stole it from someone else's book. Oh, look, she's talking about Star Wars. No, no. If I'm writing my own book, I better not be talking about Star Wars. I'm going to be fleshing it out to the point that it's detailed enough that now it's my expression, not just the bare bones of the plot. Characters that I own will be the characters that you remember from my book, honestly. There's not a real fast, fast, hard legal rule about what makes a character protectable. But I can tell you for sure, the character is the one that you know from the book. It's the one that you recognize. It's the one that I fleshed out and made important to you. The palace guard who walks in and barks something and walks back out, that's just a stock character. I don't own him. I can't keep someone else from using him. I really can't keep someone from using the orphan who didn't know he was magic and had to save the universe story. My mom is not into anything science fiction or fantasy. I think that until the second part of this story, the last time she actually saw anything remotely fantasy or sci-fi was when we went to see, um, I can't even say the second of the Star Wars movies because we're counting wrong now, but Empire Strikes Back I think was probably the last thing she saw. Then, many, many, many years later, she was um, visiting for Christmas, got sick, was trapped in the room being sick. It was before COVID. We still knew if you were that sick, you shouldn't be going around breathing on people. And she read everything she brought, so reluctantly looked to the bookshelf in there and said, oh, well, this has been real popular. Let me read this Harry Potter thing that everyone's talking about. Several chapters in, she's like, this is garbage. This is that same thing we saw in the movies. I'm like, no, it's not. And then she gave pretty much the succinct description of the plot that I gave you a couple minutes ago. I'm like, oh, yeah. She's like, the bad guy's even where, you know, you can't see his face. He's got a big cape and his name starts with a V. I'm like, shut up. <laughs> That's not okay. But to someone who doesn't read it, oh, look, it is an infringement. It's way too similar. Now, to us, no, those aren't the same. Those are completely different because of all of the details. Well, all of the details are what's protected. That basic plot that actually is the plot of most fantasy books, um, it's the one that's not the group going questing, it's the kid becoming the hero. Yeah, that's the other plot, and we like that plot. We read it as often as good authors will write it. But that plot's not what's protected. The expression is what's protected. Okay? How am I doing time? Okay. okay. Um, I want to make sure that I get through the things you have to know and still have time for questions. So. That's basically the scope of your protection. Your characters can be protected, but only to the extent that there is actual expression in those characters. If you just said, a palace guard, he's big and he's strong, and he likes smashing things, well, you got nothing there. If you give him a backstory and stuff, lovely, but if the only purpose that character serves in your story is to come in, bark something, threaten to smash someone and walk out, no one wants the backstory. So. The expression, the creativity, that's what copyright's going to protect with the paintings. The idea of drawing this beautiful landscape or a lovely painting of a horse, something like that, anyone can do that. And even if I did one, it doesn't preclude you from doing it. All you can't copy is exactly what mine is. Photographs are a little weirder because if I go to the same place and take a picture, it should be the same picture that you took. Yeah, go to where Ansel Adams was and discover that that's not actually true. But the idea is there, and photographs started make, being a little weird for copyright. We talk about, ooh, copyright got all shaken up by the digital age. No, copyright got all shaken up by piano rolls. Um, piano player, player pianos that, were, that you run the piano roll through and they play the music, that was a huge shaking point for copyright law. Copyright law has been around long enough that things that we don't think of as technology were shocking and upsetting and gave all the professors something to write about. Even back then, they had to write stuff that no one wanted to read. Um, so, Seriously, piano rolls, huge shock to the system. Xerox machines, oh my god, people could copy books. This is the end of the publishing industry because they can Xerox them. Ever try to copy an entire book? Yeah, you discover why Xerox machines were not the end of the publishing industry. Okay, the digital stuff, a little more of a threat, but the concept is still the same. Copyright law will adapt. Our problem now is how easy it is to take things. In the past, the fact that the book was a thousand pages long made it hard to copy it and steal it. Now, okay, it's easy. Now we have problems with enforcement because of that. And there aren't really good answers, but there are 
a lot of developments that make it easier or harder, depending on which side of the particular argument you're on. A lot of people, the ones who tend to create things and file copyrights, would really like to be able to protect their works from people just taking them digitally. A lot of people think that because the way modern art is often made is through mashups of other things, they will say that instead you ought to be allowing everyone to use everything any way they want to, because that's what creativity is. Well, one person's creativity is another person's stealing. Sometimes it's the same person. Um, Y'all remember the Obama poster, the campaign poster that said hope at the bottom of it? Yeah. It was a colorized photograph. The artist who did it was Shepard Ferry. The Obama administration, by the way, very cleverly said, hey, it'd be cool if you did this thing, and then took a giant step over here and let him create it. It did not belong to the Obama administration. It belonged to the artist, which was just as well, because he stole the photograph. He found a photograph that he liked and took it. It was an AP shot. There is a very easy way for him to license the photo and pay like five bucks, and he could have used it any way he wanted, but he didn't because he was an artist and couldn't be restricted by such terribly restrictive and horrible overreach of things. So he stole it, and he got sued because he wasn't allowed to do that. And he said, but I must because it's art. They told him that's nice. And he was in the process of losing one of the appeals when they settled out of court. So we don't know exactly what he agreed to do, but he was losing. Um, and then you know what happened next? Someone else took the Obama poster, and I don't know if the first, probably the first one was a cat. It was probably a grumpy cat or something. But someone took the Obama poster and made it into something else. The ink wasn't dry before Shepard Ferry sued for copyright infringement. So the same person can be both all about fair use. Wait, that's mine when someone else takes it. So which side of that's the best argument? It probably depends on whether at that moment you're trying to take someone else's work or protect your own. The law tells you there is such a thing as fair use. Usually we have plenty of people talking about that in great detail. This is what I'm going to tell you because I don't have three hours to give you all of the details. It's always an exam question for my students and I always like make them bleed and hate about it. So it's fun. I enjoy it. It causes lots of pain. The statute gives you a number of things that you have to consider for fair use. Then it tells you that, yeah, there's, you don't have to like make all of these factors. It can just be whatever you kind of think is most important. And even three out of four, maybe, but if that fourth one's really important, then maybe even if you meet three out of four, it's not fair use. So you have no idea if it's fair use until a judge tells you. Fair use is not like the, the so the right to fair use is not under the copyright law like the right to free speech or free religion. In this country, the Constitution tells us that we are born inherently with those rights. The government cannot infringe those rights because under a natural law theory, they are part of us. Fair use isn't that. Fair use is actually an affirmative defense to an action for infringement. That's different. Um, if you are sued for infringement, you can argue back by claiming, oh, but my use was a fair one. It's a fair use. And you can pull up the statute and see what the judge will come up with as to balancing those four factors. It's going to come down to things like, what are we talking about? Is this something really at the heart of copyright? Is it artsy? Is it, um, are we talking about something that is very fact-laden? Well, then the fair use is more likely. Right? Something that's very creative, probably less likely to be fair use. How much of it did you use? What did you use it for? Is it something that's going to hurt the market for the original work? Is it something that's going to compete with it? Is it something that you're using commercially? That is not the determining factor, by the way. A lot of people say, oh, well, I didn't sell it, so it's not an infringement. Doesn't matter. It's one of the factors. It's not the factor. Oh, well, I did something very creative and transformative with it. That helps. That might make it more likely to be fair use. It is unlikely I can predict correctly whether what you're doing is fair use or not, if I'm being honest. I can tell you anyway. I'm good at coming up with answers. But if you want a good one, yeah, no one can predict it. It's like trying to predict what the Supreme Court's going to rule or which horse is going to win the derby. You don't know. It's a dangerous thing to rely on because it's not predictable and it's not even relevant until you've already been sued. For a lot of people, being sued means you've lost because my people are very expensive and you've got to have one of us if you're going to be in the courtroom. I mean, you could represent yourself, but that's just kind of cute. We laugh. 
if you're in court, you need a lawyer. And we're expensive. So gauge for yourself whether you're willing to take that risk. Can you afford a lawyer if you get sued? If not, do things to avoid being sued. Now, if you're one of those people who wants to prove that fair use is there and it's important and I'm going to be a crusader, oh, go nuts. I can give you some business cards. People will take your case after you get sued. It'll be fine. But if you don't want that, take the steps to avoid it. Don't use other people's stuff. Even if on the internet they tell you that it's all fair use, and this would be free, you can always use this. No, the internet lies, you probably know that. But the same people who laugh about Dr. Dr. Google will listen to Google Lawyer. Google Lawyer is no better than Dr. Google. Don't listen to either one, please. So fair use, if you're a risk taker, yeah, go nuts. If you're trying to avoid trouble, that is not the route for you to go. With respect to the commerciality of it, let's be real. If you're writing fan fiction for yourself and all three people who follow you on Instagram, you're, you know, no one's going to find out about it. No one's really going to care. But if you're starting to sell things and get traction or not sell them, just put them out there and people are starting to notice, that's when the lawyers also notice. One other piece of misinformation I come across a lot when I'm talking to like normal humans like you guys, um, there's no rule about if you get a cease and desist letter, you have 30 days before you have to take your stuff down, or you don't have to answer until it's like the third or fourth letter. Um, I keep hearing a lot of people tell me with great sincerity that they're certain that's true. No. You may as well put butter on a burn at that point. Um, it's just not true. The cease and desist letter is really a courtesy from the lawyers saying, we didn't really want to drag you into court yet, um, but we're pointing out to you what you're doing is a problem. We think we own what you're using. The next sound you hear is going to be our court filing. Sometimes there are a few letters that follow up. None of them are required. We don't have to send a cease and desist letter. We can just haul you right into court. The cease and desist letter is a nice, polite thing that most lawyers will do to say, look, we see what you're doing. You better cut it out. Now, if you are risk averse, that's a really good time to cut it out. If you want to take that and challenge them and prove that your use is a fair one, go nuts. You'll need a lawyer, but go for it. But don't kid yourself into thinking you can just avoid that cease and desist letter, because no. Lawyers don't actually bluff, because the more stuff, and this is litigators, um, the more they send letters and the more they take you to court, the more money they make. They bill by the hour. They actually bill by six minute increments. Um, so they love to go after you and try to kill you, and they'll succeed. But they get paid for each thing they do. They love it. You won't love it. Okay, let me check my list to make sure I talked about the things that I thought was most important for you to know. Um, oh, sharing those rights. Okay, I have written the world's greatest novel. I have painted the world's... Uh, novels are easier, so I can do more things with them. See, it keeps coming to that exam. Um, so I have written the great novel. Now what? Well, I need a publisher. I'd really like a movie deal. Maybe fantasy world on ice with unicorns. Hey, I like this. Okay, I have a lot of things I want to do, and I have no way to do any of those. So I'm going to start making deals with people to do them. I want a publisher who will publish my book, either digitally or paper or both. Maybe we'll come up with a new way to publish it. Even better, they'll pay me even less for the new form. Yes! Okay, I'm going to do these things. I need a publisher. Well, I'm going to give that publisher certain rights. I don't have to give the publisher all of the rights to my book. I can just give that publisher the rights that I want to. I can decide how long it's going to last. All of those things, because now that I'm giving some of my rights away, it's all about the contract I write. It's not really copyright law anymore. Now it's contracts. And whatever contract I write with the publisher is going to determine what rights the publisher now has and that I have given away and how much the publisher is going to give me for them and if I ever get them back and all of those things. If this is my first book, chances are the publisher will say, yeah, we get everything, sign or don't. Um, you don't have a lot of leverage when you're a first-time author. But if I get to argue for some reason and get to make a better deal, great. Maybe I can keep the movie deal to myself and sell it to a studio with a different contract. 
All of this is fine, and any terms that you create are enforceable for the most part. This means even if you're doing something much smaller rather than a huge Hollywood contract, if you have a website and you want someone to do some artwork for you, if you're doing a book and want the illustration, if you are working on a show and you want some music and you want someone to create some for you, or you're creating for someone else, someone hires you as a photographer to shoot their wedding. Well, okay, I go and I take pictures at the wedding. Do the bride and the groom get my negatives or you know, a digital copy? Or do I get to keep them? Can I use them in my portfolio? Or are the photographs theirs? Huh. Well, you should have thought of that before the wedding and before the photos were taken. Think about the terms. Well, if you, got, if you saw, heard music that you thought was really good, you contacted the band and said, hey, I want to put that on my website. And they said, sure, go ahead. Well, can you use it on your website and let someone else use it on their website? If you come up with a new website, can you put it on there? What else can you do? If you, have, if you have a website and then you have a booth in the vendor's hall, can you play that music in your booth? Well, depends on what you and the band really agreed on. The moral here is write it down. Now, do not, do not, do not download something off the internet. Um, any contract you can get off the internet for free is probably worth less than you paid for it. There's an exception. Creative Commons. This is a brief ad for Larry Lessig's product. If you want to share your work that you're putting up, that you have a copyright, and you want to share your work and let people use it, you can release it with the little Creative Commons sign at the bottom. Go to the website, and there are a lot of different licenses. When we give away our rights or sell our rights, we're actually licensing them. So look for the license agreements. And the little summary at the top that tells you what's in it is actually accurate. This is true nowhere else on the internet. Any other contract you download will have crap in it you don't need and don't expect and is worse than you writing it on a cocktail napkin. I'm not kidding. You're not lawyers. It, the best thing to do is to hire someone like me to write the contract for you. And we will make sure that every term that's relevant is in there. The next best thing, if it's not a Creative Commons situation that you want and you're just you know talking to the photographer, talking to the guy with the music, whatever, or you're the guy with the music, however it works, Ask them all those background questions, not just, can I put it on my website? Yes, here's some money. Well, how long can I have it on my website? Can you change your mind? What if I substantially change my website? What if I sell my company to someone else? Can they use it? Think about all the things that might happen. Figure out what happens to the song. Now, if you're the one who's using the song, you probably care less. If you're the artist who's letting someone use their song, you probably care more. How many rights are you actually giving away? Make sure when you go into an agreement with someone about giving away rights or using their stuff that you're clear enough to think about, and then what? What about in a year? What about in two years? What might happen? Then who can do what? If everyone agrees at the outset, you don't need lawyers. But write down what you all agree to, and if you find that it's really hard to talk about money and you weren't sure you wanted to bring that up because it might offend them, you're working with the wrong person. This will go badly in the end if you can't even talk to them at the beginning before there's a conflict. Think about those things. And like I said, write it down in English. Do not try to sound like a lawyer. You'll sound like an idiot. Write it in clear English. Full sentences, no bullet points, no fragments. Use actual sentences. Otherwise, your thoughts are incomplete. No one knows what they mean. It'll work. Now, I'll do a better one. Other attorneys who draft contracts will do a better one, but we're expensive. You might not be able to afford that. If you can, yeah, you're better off with us. This is for it's that or the internet. Yours is better than the internet. Okay, what questions do we have? Yes? So, if I want to draw a picture of Superman, oh, right here, the mic. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and aim this out here. So if I wanted to draw a picture of Superman saving a cat and then come to cons and sell that at my booth, is that copyright infringement? Yes. Cool. Absolutely. Fan art, copyright infringement. Fan, fan fiction, copyright infringement. Now, will the owner of the copyright care? Eh, it depends. But what you're doing is infringement. Will you get caught? Eh, depends who walks past your booth. 
It depends how many get out there. It depends on a whole lot of things. You know, if you're speeding on 285, well, it's redundant, you're on 285, you're speeding or you're dead. Uh, but if you're blatantly breaking the speed limit and no police are there, does it make it? No. Um, is, are you still speeding? Well, yeah, you're still breaking the law. Does it matter? No, because there's no ticket. You're breaking the law, but does it matter? Well, any of the famous marks like that, the famous works, they tend to be a little more likely to at least have the resources to enforce them. And they do walk around the vendor's hall and stuff like that. Um, are you gonna get caught? Probably not. If you do, what's gonna happen? Probably first a cease and desist letter. Listen to it. You can't afford to take on, I don't even know who owns DC now, but whoever owns that, yeah, you can't take them on. It's not the mouse at least, that's Marvel, but um, don't try. Um, so yes, you're infringing, no, it may not matter, but yeah, you're infringing. So uh, I've read on the internet. Oh, no. <laughs> that, uh, Wrong. So uh, game rules are not necessarily copyrightable. So um, if you look at something like the like tabletop miniature rules where the, the lore of the game is, is often intertwined with the game rules or with like the magic system in Dungeons and Dragons where like, okay, here's a fireball and you know, it appears as a thing in your hand, and then on the on the on the map, it moves six inches, right? right whatever. Okay, you've got three. Uh, yeah, there's more. <laughs> yeah, no. So the question is, um, so what is what in there is actually copyrightable? Okay, there's several layers in there, and some of it possibly would be patentable. You can patent game mechanics if they are new and unique. They're supposed to be useful, but that's a little silly since it's a game. But um, so it's possible to patent your game mechanics if it's a new way of doing this. Um, Twister was patented. Um, what were the other ones? Monopoly had a patent. They've all expired by now. But so games like that could be patented. We, you heard how much it get, talk, costs to get a patent now. So I question whether there's a lot of purpose in that. But nevertheless, it is patentable. Your instructions are usually not going to be copyrightable, at least the just the, the mechanics of your instructions, the part that might be patentable. Um, how you play the game, those are facts, so it's a process. Those aren't going to be covered by copyright. What can be protected is how you say it. You were talking about yeah, the lore is involved in the instructions. If the instructions are roll the dice, move your mice, build a trap, not protectable. Apply sh you know, wet hair, apply shampoo, rinse, repeat, that kind of thing, not protectable. You don't get to own the facts or the process or the very distinct way of saying it. If there's only really one way to say it or a few ways to say it, you can't own that in copyright because that actually would ex would be de facto ownership of the process. Right. So um, a recipe, for instance, can't be protected because right. it's factual. What can be protected is my collection of recipes. Right. Which ones I collect and how I arrange them, that can be protected. For your game, the artwork, absolutely. Yeah. The descriptions, the nice wordy descriptions about all of this stuff? Absolutely. The function that you're describing? No. Okay. Does that answer where you're going? Yeah, yeah. I okay. just, I guess the question, like, is there a famous case or is there a case law that, that dealt with that and where wizards or somebody went and said, hey, you oh, copied our, in so many lawsuits. You copied something um, that describes magic missile. Like, what's, like, you're not allowed I mean, they to were do that. sued by Tolkien. Everyone yeah. was. It, okay. There's, there's not like one. That's Nine million cases okay, is yeah, the yeah. answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions regarding uh, the use of public domain content within uh, some original material that you're okay. going to copyright. How can you check on if something is in the public domain that is rumored to be, and then using that public domain material within something new that you're going to copyright, is it covered? Okay. Um, the way you find out if something is in the public domain is you wait another 10 to 20 years for the Library of Congress to finish their digitization program, which started about a decade ago and still is not done. Um, there's, no, there's not a searchable database of, copyrightable, of copyrighted materials. Anything that was written before the mid-20s is public domain. Anything written after that is complicated. Um, when it was drawn, it's kind of the same. If it was drawn before that, it's in the public domain. If it's after, it depends on a lot of specific details of when it was created, what was filed, what wasn't filed, was it renewed, and all of that stuff. Up until 1978, you had to 
file to have any protection. You had to jump through the right hoops to do it. If you screwed it up, copyright's dead, it's all public domain. If you filed correctly, you had a short term followed by, if you filed for renewal correctly, a second term. A lot of things can go wrong in there, so knowing when it was created doesn't help. The modern system, which went into effect in 78, it's the 1976 Copyright Act, which went into effect January 1st, 1978. Um, after the 76 Act in 78, it's the life of the author is the measure. So um, it's 70 years after the death of the authors when it goes in the public domain. So is it in the public domain? If it's modern, probably not. No filing, no renewals, no chances for it to fall into the public domain. Um, a lot less goes into the public domain now than used to. If you can figure out who wrote it and can figure out where they are, ask. This is the biggest thing. If someone did create something that is still covered by copyright, ask if you can use it. I mean, if it's Disney, don't waste your time. The answer is no. But if it's an actual human somewhere who created something, they might let you use it. People like it when people like their stuff. Actually, humans will often let you. But finding out if it's public domain, there's not a database or a searchable anything. So that's a trick. If it is public domain, and you know that, and you want to use it in your work, that's totally fine. You can freely use it any way you want to. It will not be protected within your work, though. Only the new stuff that you do is going to be protected. You can't, in effect, pull something out of the public domain by putting it in your new work. So once it's in the public domain, it's there forever. There's a slight exception that is great on an exam question, does not apply to any of you, um, so it's fine. But assume that once it's in the public domain, it's there forever and ever. You can't protect it later. Wait, what's the exception? But you can use it. If it was a foreign issue, if it was a foreign author within the 1991 Uruguay round of the Berne Convention. Wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know details. <laughs> or I made that up completely because none of y'all would know. But it's right. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Excellent. All right. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, having this. Uh, copyright's been kind of a weird hobby for me recently, so I'm inflicting all this pain on myself in front. Um, this question, whenever I, I described to myself that I was coming to a copyright panel, I had four people ask me to ask this question. Okay. This might be too new, so it might not have an answer at all. But creative content created via artificial intelligence, uh, which uses others' art as training data. Is there enough information? Is it a case-by-case -case basis? Would copyright belong to anybody in the process or nobody at all as accord according to a recent case that happened? Technically, under modern interpretation of copyright and the current rules of the Copyright Office and the Registrar of Copyright, the author, the creator, must be a human. Okay. However, you're allowed to use a machine. So if I were to take that and say, I created this by setting up this program and this machine, and this is what came out the other end, but I was the creative force, I can be the author of it. Just like I can use a camera to make a, photo a photograph, I can use a computer to do something, and it can still be my work, but only if I'm the creative force behind it. If it's just a computer that figured something out for itself, and this is just something it's doing before it takes over society, then there, it won't be copyrightable. It won't matter because the computers will control everything soon anyway. But there has to be a human author for a copyright to issue. Okay. Now, whether you, like I said, whether you can call the program or the human author is going to depend a lot on the specific facts of that case. Um, the, it was a famous case for a while that this um, monkey stole the photographer's film and took a selfie of himself. Um, if you Google monkey selfie, you'll find this kind of cool picture of a monkey. Um, the photographer should have asked a lawyer first because what he did was post it and say, look, my monkey took this picture, isn't this cool? Send money to the place where he lives because it's a refuge for sad monkeys. Send us money. And the picture went viral and people started using it a lot. There was no copyright notice on it. Well, you don't need one. The other thing that you should know is the little copyright notice is not required, but put it on there anyway because some people think if it's not there, it's public domain. So if you put the little C, fewer people will steal it. It's not required, but sometimes it's smart. It's like locking your car door. Um, so this photographer said that the monkey took the picture all by himself. Isn't this great? He invented the first monkey selfie. 
Well, that means it's not copyrightable because animals can't own copyrights. If he had said, I have, I had this really curious monkey, let's call him George, and <laughs> I knew that if I left him alone with his equipment, he would start taking pictures, so I set it up so that he was there and could do this, and I set up the whole thing, and this is the picture that, developed, that happened, then I could be the human that's the um, creative force behind the copyright. But I went to get a sandwich, the monkey did it all by himself, which is the story he told. Who knows what actually happened? That was a cool story, but it gutted his ability to have copyright. PETA jumped in and said, we speak for the monkeys. We will take the rights to that photograph and do good things with it. Um, fortunately, even the California courts didn't go for that. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Are there monkeys in this one? <laughs> okay. So I work for a residential house design firm, always have multiple ones, uh, multi-million dollar lawsuits while I've gone through. I've always been curious because designers always use influence from other designers. I mean, there's only so many ways you can design a house. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen some one, ten, twenty million dollars, I mean, multi, and I was always curious, what's the, uh, that's going to be a hard question, man. what's the fine line that, you know, defines what you what goes through and you know makes it fully, I guess, where they consume and what you know goes through where they're protected. The biggest, the biggest thing there for a functional answer to that. There's, yeah. as you expect, a whole. Yeah, that's too much. Answer. I know, but I was uh, curious. But the very the the functional answer to that is you can't copyright the functional parts of your design. Right. So you know, there's got to be a door. There's got to be windows. Precisely. There's got to be stairs. Where do you put the windows? Well, you usually put them where people can see out and light comes in. So a lot of how you design a house is really pretty much driven by function. Right. Anything that's driven by function, even if that's a really pretty way to do the function, if it's really all about the function, then it's not gonna be protected. If, if like say, oh, that's a neat way to put the windows there so they're still functional. Yeah, it's more, if there's enough function to count, then it, but if you just made the windows into the shape of a dragon, coincidentally, right. um, that could be protected because that's just stupid and expensive and has no function at all. Okay. So if it's stupid, expensive and has no function, it's probably protectable. If it actually works, then that element you can't protect. Okay, great. Thank you. We can talk about blueprints later. All right. So I have a question regarding um, things found online. This initially started a question about uh, code tutorials that I found online. I mm -hmm. thought maybe you could extend to tutorials in general, but that probably patent because a lot of internet tutorials are processes. So for code found online, um, I'm a programmer mm -hmm. and sometimes I go looking for tutorials. And the right. code I found online, like what copyrightable state is that if it was posted online with the intent of it being a tutorial for others to follow? It's going to depend on how it was posted and what terms were there. Look for if there's a license attached to it. It's a GNU license or Creative Commons. The um, software should be under the GNU license. And that's one that is sort of a ticking time bomb because if you take a piece of that code, even though it was shareware when it was put up there, it was put, oh, look at shareware. If you take that and put it into your program, which y'all do every day, um, it makes the entire program shareware. A lot of companies have lost multi million dollar proprietary programs that way because a programmer went and used shareware that for a small process that you, know, you use all the time. Um, it's just what you do. And yeah, it blows the whole thing into shareware. But um, aside from that, with respect to how the tutorial is posted, is going to make a big difference. If they're saying, this is how you do something, this is how you change the name in Word and make it change even when you save it, that was my recent problem. Um, when I found that list of instructions, it's instructions. That's not protectable. How to do it is not protectable. It, the way they expressed it, if it was more than purely functional, maybe they did it in um, iambic pentameter. That expression would be um, protectable. Probably they didn't, because when you're trying to figure out how to use code, you probably have used up all of your sense of humor. So um, it was probably very functional, very straight language. There's probably nothing copyrightable there. So it's the difference of like whether this is a way to do it or the way to do it? Doesn't really matter if it's the way to describe this way versus anyone could do this. You know, how do you draw? Well, okay, those are going to be very more expressive instructions. How do I change the field on this? That's going to be very functional. If it's just functional instructions that you can follow easily without going, would you shut up and just tell me how to do it? Um, if you aren't getting that frustrated, it's probably not practical at all. It's probably very factual and functional. Lists and instructions are not usually protected. Okay, sure. 
Hello. I have a curious question regarding like artwork and stuff. Okay. Specifically in the case of what happens when someone gets a tattoo of a piece of art? Um, I imagine things are copyrighted, but copyrights generally ask you to stop doing stuff. Can you be sued to like get the tattoo covered and other stuff like that? There, that's developing as we speak. Um, mm -hmm. There was Mike Tyson sued someone mm -hmm. because Tyson has a distinctive tattoo on his face, video game and someone it. Yeah. used it, but they put it on their own face. If they're doing it in the video game, that's easy. I can sue and make them stop. But once you've put it on your own face, first off, why? But um, second <laughs> off, well, crap. Now you've got one of the meanest, meanest, scariest people on the planet, really angry at you. You're lucky he's just sending the lawyers. Um, what if he decides to take the artwork off your face? He could. I mean, he, Andrew Holyfield's ear off, he could bite your tattoo off. But um, <laughs> if it is original artwork that he has on his face, it's gonna depend on the agreement he had with the tattoo artist. Hmm. He may just be the canvas, not the artist. I wouldn't tell Mike Tyson that. But I might tell someone else with a tattoo that. Um, but so who is the author? Who's the artist? Who's the canvas? So what happens in a case where someone, let's say, dovetailing off one of their comments, gets a tattoo of Superman on their arm? It is an infringing use. Will they ever tell you not to? No, people get Superman tattoos all the time. Usually when you are talking about things like Superman's S shield or the whole Superman thing, yes, technically that's an infringement, both mm -hmm. of trademark and copyright. However, are they going to care? No. They don't care if you cosplay here. Is it an infringement? Absolutely. Are you, are you going to do it without trouble? Absolutely. No one cares. They, they understand that, I mean, come on, we're the consumers that they're hoping to attract. If they piss us off every year by going around Dragon Con and suing people, that's not smart. Even the, industry, even the um, big industries have figured that out. So you can make your own Snow White costume. You can go to Dragon Con in your Snow White costume. Now, if you start doing adult shows in that Snow White costume, the Disney lawyers are coming knocking. Could they have stopped you from wearing it to Dragon Con? Absolutely. Will they know? Mm -hmm. um, once you start doing things that they disapprove of is when you hear from them. Now, with respect to the tattoo, would they technically have the right to say that's not an authorized use? Well, did the tattoo artist have a license? Maybe. I mean, when you buy t-shirts and stuff with logos on it, most of those, the decal or the art was purchased or licensed from the studio. So it's okay. When you buy the ho when you buy a Halloween costume at Party City, and you feel a little bit ashamed that you're buying a Halloween <laughs> costume at Party City and not making it yourself, but the party's tomorrow, you've got to do something, I'm going to add something to it to make it better, um, but I'm still a little bit ashamed. But that costume I'm buying is licensed merchandise already, so I can wear it. Now again, I can wear it to a party, I can wear it to Dragon Con, I'm not even in trouble for making this costume because it's official and it's licensed merchandise. Can I wear it in my own movie? Can I wear it as I dance on a pole in a nightclub? Yeah, that's where they're going to object to it. But the costume itself is licensed, so it's fine. What was the source of that Superman tattoo? I don't know. Maybe it was licensed. I doubt it, just based on tattoo artists, but this is all theoretical for me. I may be the only person on the planet yet who does not actually have a tattoo, which is largely because I've heard that they use needles. Thank you. How are we on time? Okay, good. Did you say um, places are copyright if they're in like books like places. Hogwarts? Oh, um, a school of wizardry, that's fine. That's an idea. That specific school of wizardry, well, the classical fantasy stuff in there ghosts in the school of wizardry. Okay, yeah. Um, turrets in the school of wizardry. Yeah. Um, most of the aspects of the British public school system. Yeah. It was weird to us. It's just school to them. Um, so all of the, they don't usually have the hat that tells them which part, which house to be in. Usually. I'm never sure about the prince. So those sorts of things are the idea and facts. That's fine. Or trope. Um, anything that's the generic trope of, okay, I don't expect the sorcerer to go to school in a modern skyscraper. That would just be weird. We wouldn't like that book. Um, unless Robert Astor wrote it. He did those sorts of things. But so the specifics that made Hog, the, the stuff that we recognize when, um, 
probably only a couple of you are old enough to have done this. If you read the book before you saw the movie, that's what people used to do. Um, when you saw the movie of Harry Potter, most of the stuff you went, yeah, I know what that is because I recognize it. A few things, of course, said, no, that's not what it looks like. But whenever you see a movie from the book you've read, you say, well, that's not what it looks like. Well, those kinds of details are protected because you knew what it looked like in your head and they got it wrong in Hollywood. Um, but, those, but the things that made Hogwarts identifiable, the reason that when we saw the movie, we knew exactly what that was, we said, look, that's Hogwarts. Um, we knew because we recognized it. Those are the things that are protectable. Okay. But, so the, but, sorry, the, you, you can't copyright the word Hogwarts, but you can trademark it if they're using it on mm -hmm. stuff? Is that Yes, correct? something that's in, well, names and things like that as part of your book, yeah. Because if I use, okay, that's a long and confusing answer unless I get into fields that we're not covering, so sort of. Um, as a general rule, yes, if you have an individual word or a title or a slogan, that's going to be trademarked because it's telling you this is from this series, this is from this author. Right. Um, the Hogwarts itself, yeah. the expression of the school yeah. that we have named Hogwarts, the name is part of the expression. Right. So, yes and no, and that's going to be really, really, really fact-dependent on whether I could say Hogwarts in a book to mean something completely different or yeah. not. Okay. So, like, the image that, um, like, J.K. Rowling and all those people who officially make mm -hmm. images of Hogwarts, like, that is the image kind of copyrighted? It's both. There's a separate movie in the book and in the movie, and they're not exactly identical. It gets interesting in kind of a philosophical way to those of me who don't have friends or anything to do. Um, it, when you have an actor who plays the role, when you're thinking of Harry Potter, you're actually thinking of Daniel Radcliffe, aren't you? Well, does that mean that he can't use his face again in another movie? That seems unlikely. Um, but is he now the image of Harry Potter? Oh crap, I don't like that because that's weird because he gets to keep his face, I think. I haven't read his contract. Um, <laughs> But you, it, it gets a little strange. Where does the actor end and the character begin? But in the book, it's easier. We know the description. You can also own a character that's identifiable against lots of different iterations. Mm, Batman. It doesn't matter which Batman. We recognize it. Now, when I say Batman, each of you had an image in your head. Anyone else thinking Adam West? One. Thank you. You may just be throwing me a bone here, but I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> the rest of you probably had a different one in your mind. That's okay, you knew it was Batman. Batmobile. Actually, the Batmobile, there is a case, and the result was the Batmobile is a protectable character. An inanimate object can be a protectable character in a book or comics or movie or all of the above if it has enough, enough specific characteristics that you would have to know to get an A on my exam. You don't have to know. But basically, do I recognize the Batmobile each time I see it? Yeah, we all know what it looks like, even though it looks very differently in my Adam West world to y'all's dark, evil world. Um, <laughs> but we both recognize the other one. We know it's the Batmobile. It's protect that's actually a protectable character, even though its appearance has changed. It has enough inherent detailed characteristics that we recognize it. And in my mind, and when I get to write all of the laws, this will be part of it, when we recognize the character, that's the protectable part. When it's just a cool car, eh, that could be a lot of different things. Hey. Hello. Um, what about if you're making a comedy and you're trying to make a parody of one of these copyrighted characters? Um, fair use is where parody comes in. So technically, if it is a true parody, not just making fun of, different things, um, in fact, we learned because of a really good lawyer with a really bad result in the case um, that parody doesn't even have to be funny. Um, but if you are making fun of that character as a way of criticizing that character, not using the famous character to be funny for some other reason, but parodying that character that is supposed to be one of the I specifically identified examples of fair use. You're allowed to use it for educational uses, for criticism, and parody. And can you rely on that? No. Educational use, the statute literally says uses to, that are fair use include educational use inference including copies for classrooms. 
Then there was a case about a professor who had copies made to use in his classroom and lost the copyright suit. Right there in the book. Um, the judge actually said the problem was that the secretary actually made the copies. So you're telling me every time they used to have Kinko's packs for stuff in college that that was not covered by fair use? Of course it's covered by fair use. You could still lose the case. Um, but technically, yes, parody is smack dab, allowed, express language in the statute, except when it's not. The easiest way to get in trouble for something that you thought was parody and it isn't is to use the famous elements of something to do something else. One of the um, cases was the... Um, Star Trek, there was the, um, oh, the places you'll boldly go. Uh, do the Dr. Seuss book, they made it into a Star Trek book. Well, the parody they were doing really had nothing to do with Dr. Seuss. They were just using Dr. Seuss to make their Star Trek comic book look more clever and sell more copies. There wasn't, they weren't actually parodying Dr. Seuss. They were using Dr. Seuss kind of to parody Star Trek, but it was infringing Dr. Seuss, and his estate sues a lot. Um, the older than that was um, O.J. Simpson. Someone made a um, little rhyme about the O.J. Simpson case using very identifiable Dr. Seuss verse. They wrote a story of the O.J. trial in Dr. Seuss verse. Well, O.J.'s got nothing to do with Dr. Seuss. That wasn't a parody of Dr. Seuss. And they lost that lawsuit too. So, parody, yes, but. What is the scope of copyright in terms of internationality? It is... Uh, it depends. Um, we now have the Berne Convention, which is an international treaty. So any signatory to the Berne Conven Convention is contract. The Big Berne Treaty. Um, anyone who has signed it, which is most of the world, we were one of the last ones to join. Um, any of those people who are, any of the countries that are in the Berne Convention abide by its rules, meaning they will give a foreign copyrighted work the same treatment in their country that their own that they would give to their own works. Um, and that's the basic rule. This is one of the few where there really is some comprehensive international coverage. Trademarks and patents you have to file everywhere. Um, that's really expensive. But copyright theoretically is covered internationally, but not to non-signatories. Okay. okay. That's uh, about all the time we have. You bet. Thanks. All right. And we're done. <laughs>